autism research, um, autism has been very much in the news lately and it's uh, pretty much everywhere you look. It's been a really remarkable thing to watch just as a phenomenon of watching people become very interested in it. My uh, younger sister is autistic and when I was a child, the only thing I knew about autism was the fact that, that Karen was autistic. Uh, now it seems to be in the news everywhere. Um, what's known about autism, the number one thing that's known about autism is that it seems to be largely genetically determined. If one identical twin is autistic, then the odds of the other twin having some kind of autism spectrum disorder is between 50 and 80 percent. And that's just a tremendous probability. And that's not the case for non-identical twins, for fraternal twins. And so that's a major piece of evidence that autism is largely genetic. And one big story in the last five years has been the identification of genes that, um, that increase the risk of autism. And it's not one gene. It seems to be some more complex polygenic disorder where you, you get dealt a bunch of genes from, uh, from your mother and your, for your father from your father, and if you draw the wrong combination of genes, say between two and 10 genes, then that increases the risk of being autistic. So that's the main thing that's known. Um, as far as, uh, um, uh, as, far as the, the later development of it, um, people are starting to look at structural differences between the brains of autistic people and what are called neurotypical people, and those are changes that uh, take place in the neocortex, which is the largest part of our brain, um, and also in the cerebellum, which people used to think of as being a sensory or a motor structure, but seems to be perhaps important also for, for more advanced cognitive tasks. And so the cerebellum is, is, has been fingered in the last few years. Uh, as far as treatments for autism, right now the one kind of treatment that seems to be somewhat helpful is behavioral therapy, especially uh, when children are, are diagnosed and identified as needing the help young. And so that is interesting because it's the one way that seems to possibly help kids who have autism. And it may be part of why diagnosis rates have gone up, because it's recognized that those therapies can help kids. And so people are motivated to identify these problems in their kids when they're young, because that's when it's possible to maybe catch these things and, and help these kids um, integrate better into the rest of society. One characteristic of autism therapy in the last few years has been basically taking autistic kids and seeing what can be done to help them. And I think that's sort of, um, um, I wouldn't call it palliative, but it's, it's in, the, in the category of um, helping kids who are already diagnosed with autism, who've already been through a lot of the developmental stages that lead to autism. And, it's, um, and in some sense, the horse is out of the barn. And then it's a question of what you can do to help these kids to, um, to bring to them the kind of social skills that would help them work much better in, in society. Um, I think treatment is a ways away. It's, um, it's not in the next five years or even next 10 years. Uh, but I think that understanding the mechanisms in development that lead to autism could eventually lead to some kind of therapy that could perhaps uh, nip autism in the bud uh, when kids are, you know, when their brains are making these developmental choices early in life. Um, so I think it's a ways off. But I think the research starts pointing towards better therapies. There are cases of people who can perform astounding mathematical feats with their brains. And, uh, and to my knowledge, it is not well understood exactly what it's doing there. Um, one way to think about it is that our brains are kind of sloppy. We have these uh, shortcuts and tricks that our brains used, honed over um, millions of years of evolution to come up with quantitative um, intuitions about the world. And there's something uh, that's possible that most of us don't tap. And what's interesting is the idea that these people use other algorithms entirely that somehow they've run across to perform their mathematical feats. Um, I think it's not well understood, and uh, I'm, I'm not sure that, uh, that we're in a position right now to understand how they do that. Well, Mozart had something going, right? Didn't he write Twinkle Twinkle Little Star when he was six? Uh, you know, I, look, I mean, no offense to most of the world's six-year-olds, but you know, most six-year-olds aren't writing tunes that survive across the ages. So clearly Mozart had something going. Uh, in the case of Einstein, um, Einstein was a very, very smart man who in his 20s made a series of discoveries in rapid succession that completely upended our understanding of the world. Uh, but one thing he had as well was he was thinking very hard about these problems. He had a patent clerk job that allowed him to think hard about physical problems, um, you know, kind of on the side. And so he was given the opportunity to, um, to daydream a little bit on the job. And that was, um, that was pretty valuable. Mm -hmm.